receive you, and I welcome you to First Presbyterian Church in the name of Jesus Christ. I welcome those of you who are here and those of you who are now a part of our online community. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. First thing I want to say, particularly for those at home, is that this is a communion Sunday. So if you don't have bread and juice already, please go and get that now. The rest of you, I'd like to direct you to those cards. If you'd fill that in, that helps us know who is here, uh, helps us welcome first-time visitors. And if there was any contact tracing that needed to be done, it would also give us an idea of who we have to go talk to. You can put those with the pencil in the offering basket on the way out. You also have at your place a little cup like this. It's communion package, and it's a peel and eat a variety, peel and drink, and Mary and I tried this on Thursday, got it out of the box and saw it for the first time, and uh, you know, it was a little bit difficult, so what I want to say is, if you're having a hard time, we do have ushers who will be masked and wearing latex gloves to help you open, and I don't want the spiritual meaning to get lost by being distracted in the mechanics of opening this up. So this is one time, uh, if at first you don't succeed. Uh, the other things I want to tell you is that uh, technology-wise, it's, it's uh, challenging, interesting. Uh, you are live right now with the uh, Facebook community and on our website. And uh, we need to start it early to get it onto the website and it will continue for a few minutes as we go. And so it makes it seem like we're a real church. I think the thing that I'm conscious of is when it's live, if I stub my toe, I want to make sure I say praise the Lord. And so uh, just uh, be aware of uh, it being real church, real live. All the other information about our church, uh, when Bible studies are opening, how, and all of that, you can get on our Facebook page, we love First Sebastian, or on our website, we love First.org. Those are our main ways of communicating these days. There's also an e devotional, and you can sign up at the website. It also has ongoing information. Let's be called to worship with these words Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within us. Let us Praise His holy name. We go to God in prayer. We do want to delight in you, O God, of beauty and grace and truth and power. We do want to say thank you for your blessings. And we do want to entreat you for strength in the daily life we have. We do ask that you bring your goodness upon us and all peoples as we make this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us say who it is we worship and what we believe by rising and using the Apostles' Creed. The words are on the screen. Together, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being in one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was in We acknowledge the baptism for the remission of sins, 
do you know? The boss won't like it. Well, how do you know? You can't do that. Well, how do you know? I just ask, how do you know? Consequently, I've done a whole bunch of things that people just assume couldn't be done. And I found it fascinating in that moment that he was defining his identity largely by a single question. I found it interesting because in the Bible, there's not one but two questions that we are to ask that actually define our identity. And we're going to look at those questions today and see what it means for us. Let's pray. Lord, we do ask that you would move in preacher and people in such a way that it is for your glory and for our good. Your servants listen and speak, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the 22nd chapter of the Acts of the Apostle. I'm going to read four verses, 6 through 10. Listen here. While I was on my way and approaching Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone on me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? I answered, Who are you, Lord? Then he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. I asked, What am I to do, Lord? The Lord said to me, Get up and go to Damascus, and there you will be told everything that has been assigned to you. And the reading ended at the tenth verse, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness have we all received grace on grace. Hallelujah. Amen. So those two questions are right there in that little paragraph unit. The interrogatives are, who are you, Lord? And most of the time in church when we say Lord, we mean Jesus. But in the Bible, many times the word Lord is equivalent to say, sir, and so until he knows that it's Jesus, he might take that as, uh, who are you, sir? And then there's, what do you want me to do, or sir? And uh, these questions are interesting questions, and all of us are asking questions these days. I find people saying, well, how do you make this Zoom meeting work on my computer? And we have people who are saying, well, what's going to happen with the economy? We have people who are saying, when is that going to come out? And uh, those are, are interesting questions, but they're of a, a different category than these two here in this text. Who are you, sir? What do you want me to do, sir? Uh, you know, I've been a father for lots of years, and in that fathering, I read this book so many times. Do you recognize this book? Are You My Mother? You know, i got to stop here and tell you, I read something funny the other day. A pastor was talking to children, and he asked the question, uh, why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? And one little boy raised his hand, and he called up and says, because that's where his mother was. So, <laughs> that about says it, doesn't it? It just comes down to that. I just said it better myself. That's where his mother was. But anyway, this book, there's a little critter that goes around asking animals, are you my mother? And it, it turns out well, uh, finds the mother. Uh, but you got to admit, who cares about how Zoom meetings work on computers if you don't know who your mother is, right? And, and the questions we have in the text are of this different category where if you don't ask it and you don't answer it, uh, you're, you're just never quite at home in the world, ever. So uh, these are a different kind of question. And when the question comes to uh, out of Paul's mouth, it's when he's knocked on his backside off his horse onto the road by this bright light. And when he asks, notice he doesn't say, is someone there? He knows someone is there. And the Bible tells us again and again that human beings know that there is a God. We may try to suppress that, but actually it's something that we cannot not know. Uh, it's, it's there for all of us to know. So he, he doesn't say, is someone there? He knows someone is there. It's like the other night, I got a phone call, 
And somebody asked my son, Griffin, well, it's my cell phone. Nobody ever calls for Griffin on my cell phone. And he hasn't lived with us for years. So why aren't they calling me on my cell phone at home? And so I said, you know, who are you? And they hung up. So I didn't say there's someone there. I knew someone was there. I wanted to know who that was. And that's, that's what Paul is doing. Now, notice, because he got put on his backside, I think, by this bright light, that he asked the question in a certain way. First of all, he answers it, he asked it uh, sincerely. Uh, he genuinely wants to know. He, there's been a shock in there's some kind of puzzlement, but this isn't a pretend inquiry, like, oh yeah, God, if you're there, I really want to know you, but I got these 29,000 other things to do in front of that. Now, this is pretty immediate, pretty pressing, and very sincere. Also, it has a respect to it. Uh, he has been put on his backside, and he's, uh, he's thinking, you know, I, I need to be humble in front of this. And, and frankly, that's a, a great way to be, to recognize the sincerity and the tone of the request. Because many times in life, we end up on our backsides, and one of the values in it is that we feel a pressing need to seek the Lord, and we do so humbly. And that sincere seeking with humility really harvests a lot of response from God. In this case, the answer to who are you, sir, is Jesus of Nazareth. And of course, Paul, having been in Jerusalem, knew about Jesus, who had been uh, crucified. And thousands had turned to Jesus, saying that they had seen him risen. But, but Paul was oblivious to all of that. And he hunted Christians in a, in a Gestapo-like kind of way. And so he's uh, listening to who this is, that it's, it's Jesus, and he's quite surprised. Now, any time people set out to debunk Christianity, one of the things they have to come up against is the resurrection. And one of the things they find is how do you explain disciples who were cowards, who overnight became lion-like in their courage, willing to give up their very lives? How do you explain that? Well, you would explain it by them needing the risen Jesus. It reorganized their lives from top to bottom. But let's not forget Paul in this. He comes along later, and here he is, this guy who's a rabid rabbi, hunting down and killing Christians, and overnight, he becomes the biggest proponent of Christianity and Christ that the world has ever seen. What accounts for that? He met the living Jesus Christ. Newsweek, uh, in the last couple of days, cited a survey that said 52% of Americans don't believe that Jesus is gone. I, I frankly thought it'd be a lot higher. I thought it'd be 80% or something like that. Uh, but what they thought is that Jesus is a great teacher. Now to be sure, Jesus is a great teacher. But Jesus being a great teacher doesn't explain what happened to the disciples, doesn't explain what happened to Paul. There's someone there, it's Jesus, he has a power, we approach him with sincerity and humility, and he meets us and can change our lives. Now, the next question, what do you want me to do, Lord, is logical, uh, because Jesus obviously has a power greater than Paul has, he's made himself come back to life, he's shown a bright light that knocked him off his stallion. And the way it works is that people with most power direct those with less power, <laughs> right? Isn't that the way it works? And when he hears about Jesus and he sees his power, he realizes that this is the love and truth and power and beauty of God in a person that was the awaited Messiah. And that Messiah is a king. And kings have subjects. And the way it works is subjects say to the king, what do you want me to do, Lord? And so that's what he does. Now, it's a challenging question. And I think one of the reasons we suppress the knowledge of God is that we'd rather not ask that question. Uh, I'd be fine with the Lord asking me what I want him to do for me. 
But the other way around, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. So, it kind of, uh, when, when I was uh, early in my professional ministry career, I, I did lots of weddings. But the first couple, I learned something such that when I sat down in premarital counseling with a couple, I said to them, and particularly to the bride, to be, listen, when the wedding comes, I am the officiant. I'm the one who's directing the show. And I'm saying that real clearly right now that I want you to get that message across to your mother. Okay? <laughs> and the reason was that I had done a couple of weddings where it was plain that the mother was going to make that daughter's wedding the best day of the mother's life. <laughs> and, uh, and she was telling me when we would start, how we would come in. Imagine having that experience if I walked in and a mother came up and said, you're the officiant, you know what's going on, I'm going to discuss, what do you want me to do to help? I would have, you'd have to pick me up off the floor, right? <laughs> so, that's the way that Paul is approaching it. And yet, you know, the way sin is, it steals right in, even on the heels of our relationship with God. Because Oh, someone's there is Jesus. Hey, that's great. Jesus, I'd like you to help me out with finding a new place to live, making my boss sweeter, and uh, fixing this other economic issue that I have, right? So, uh, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to take care of A, B, and C for me. But, you know, it's not that we have a mission for God. God has a mission for us. In fact, the better way to say it is that God has a need for His mission. And that's just part of that humility and recognizing who God is, is that we say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, doesn't that sound like the Lord's Prayer? That part where it says, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. It's, it's about what do you want? I'm going to listen to what you want rather than just spurt out all the things that I want. And speaking of that, I've got to admit that that's pretty much what my prayer times look like, especially in the morning. I wake up and say, Lord, I need your help with this, 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 and this. Read this and go, what would that prayer time be like if I really said, Lord, who are you? Show me. And then if I said, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Tell me. Wouldn't that just change things a lot? We're going to come to uh, communion. And communion is a prayer time. And what I want to suggest is that you take those identity-forming questions. Uh, take one in one hand, take one in the other. Take one with the bread, one with the juice, okay? And say, Lord, who are you? Show me. And then say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Tell me. We come now to the litany. Say it with me. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And it's right our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Lord, you're the one who told us to have this meal and have it be a commemoration of your redemptive death, but also an anticipation of the heavenly banquet. And so we ask that you would keep those before our minds and hearts, that you would, as the word says, bring a communion, a uniting of us to you and us to that's our hope. Thank you for meeting us in this meal. In Jesus' name, amen. The scriptures tell us that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And having blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. All of you drink it. As often as you take the bread and the cup, you and I are playing the Lord's death until He comes again. This is the food of God for the people of God. Taste and see that the Lord is perfect. Now take the bread. 
just a moment, I'm going to give you the charge and the benediction. Before that, I want to say thank you to Rochelle for working on the sound system this week, for Jim being here to advance slides and control that. Hart was here earlier, Hart real hard. Mary's been here at two services, a number of people helping get the room set up, helping with uh, the uh, cups and all of that. And then uh, Pete and Ken came in on Friday and did a, a, a cleansing, a kind of a foggy kind of cleansing so that we'd all be safe this morning. So many thanks to those folks. We also had a virtual coffee hour, so you can get a virtual cup of coffee and join us virtually. Uh, and that will be at 1130 on the Facebook page. There's a link. Uh, we've had Ralph Smith from New York and others uh, be a part of having just a few minutes of a catch-up conversation. So you might want to get home and uh, click on that, and you can change clothes and go out to lunch or whatever you're going to do. So I want to invite you to that. The other thing is that last week, I dismissed us by rows to kind of keep us more spread out, but I wasn't real fond of that. I figured that you all could figure out how to keep six feet apart and get out at your own pace, and then it also gives you an opportunity to talk with each other. Of course, with that distance and uh, giving fist bumps and virtual hugs and all of that kind of thing. So, uh, that being said, please stand and I'll give you the charge of benediction. Brothers and sisters, remember wherever you are, Christ has put you there. There's something He wants to do for you there. Wherever you go, Christ is sending you. There's something He wants to do for you there. Believe this. Rely on His power, His grace, and His love. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance and give you peace, now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.